we are needed to create the prompt or to monitor that or to think, how can we try something new? Because at the end of the day, these templates and AI can just reproduce what's already happening. So our role is going to be more at the innovation side of things, of kind of like creative thinking is going to be really the skill. And I like that. I'm excited about it. This is Writers in Tech, a podcast where today's top content strategists, UX writers, and content designers share their well-kept industry secrets. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Writers in Tech, a podcast brought to you by the UX Writing Hub, which is the first and only UX writing bootcamp in the world. And I recommend you to check our website. We have over there a weekly newsletter and a lot of great stuff. And today we have a wonderful guest which is a person that I'm looking up to for seven years now. One of the leaders when it comes to design and UX and web flow and freelancing. And his name is Ron Segal. Ron, how are you? Yeah, what's up, man? Good to be on the show. Oh my God, I've been waiting for this episode for six months already. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it and excited for the conversation as well. That's awesome. So um, to those of you who are not familiar with Ran Segal, I recommend you to check Flux Academy. It's a wonderful YouTube channel that taught me a lot about UX and freelancing. And yeah, so what's your background? Is like, How did you become such an influencer and educator in the world of UX and freelancing? So I always like to share my thoughts and opinions, I guess, about design and about the way that I was working. Actually, I did a design degree in Shankar. It's a school here in Israel. And even back then, we had kind of like a blog, internal blog of a few friends where we would share thoughts about design, even as students. And after graduating, when I got my first job as a, in a branding agency, actually, I opened up another blog and started to write in Hebrew. So I always like to share thoughts because I started sharing thoughts very early, right? You're right out of school. Not like I had tons of experience, but I shared my learning kind of like on the go. I think maybe that's because I didn't have too much friends who wanted to talk to me about the things that excited me, (laughs) you know, about design and UX and all of that kind of stuff. So I just spoke to myself or to the internet. So initially wrote in Hebrew, then started writing in English and having a blog and then later on a YouTube. So my kind of like my teaching and audience has grown together with my experience. And now at this point, I'm doing it for like over creating content for over a decade design, I guess, for 20 years almost. That's I'm kind of an old person. Yeah, man. <laughs> like funny story. When I entered UX for the first time, I guess 2015, 16, something like that, I was a bit lost. And there wasn't a lot of content creators in the world of UX. So I opened YouTube and I searched and you had these vlogs. Uh, about like a day in the life of a UX freelancer. The editing was so on point that I couldn't believe that someone here in Israel is doing it. I thought it's someone from like, I don't know, California or something like Santa Monica, like sharing his insights. And it took me like a few videos to understand that it's like an Israeli creator. And since then I'm hooked following the channel that grew a lot. I think you have like half a million followers now on YouTube, right? Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking the other day how much In general, I think the style of YouTube changed because like six years ago when I just started, I think vlogging was really popular, which is kind of like daily showing the behind the scenes of what you're doing. Now it's a little bit different. It's like more produced videos and edited and and stuff like that. But yeah, it, it honestly started as a kind of like a side project with no revenue, you know, goals to it. Just I was watching other people's vlogs and I was always wanted to see the behind the scenes of the life of a designer couldn't find it on YouTube. So I just created it on my own. It's kind of like a fun, creative exercise. Yeah. And there was this show that was very popular back then called like, I guess the translation would be connected, like Mechubarim. Yeah. And it yeah. was very like a documentary yeah, about yourself. Show. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I haven't watched it. You had uh, this famous guy, I forgot his name, this guy from New York, I believe. With like Casey, he, Casey he, Neistat. He kept doing those yeah. Casey, Casey, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's like the one I'm thinking. Yeah, he was about my inspiration. To, like like I was daily. addicted to his yeah. show. That's awesome, man. So all right. So I know that you like 
you were experimenting with the idea of education. I remember you had this startup, New School, I believe. And correct me if I'm wrong. I just, I'm just picking from my memory, like your history. Then I remember you had like a startup, Prospero, with yeah. like so the, the contract. What happened was I wanted to start something in education after quitting my job as a designer in a startup. And I was very passionate about both designers and freelancing because those were things that I was doing. And I was, we were trying to basically fill in the gap of all the skills that they don't teach you in design school. So I started doing that with two friends. And that actually, although we had a blog which picked up the course, we launched two courses, which didn't like really massively take off, at least not well enough for to support us. So we kept on having like day jobs. I was freelancing as a designer. And then as part of the courses, we created a, a tool for creating proposals for freelancer, which then we kind of like pivoted and saying, all right, we did, it didn't work out in the education space. So let's focus on this tool. And then, so we kind of pivoted into focusing only on this tool. And then one of the partners left and the tool never picked up too much as well. And so eventually we sold it and we each went our separate ways. And eventually I came back to, you know, I kept doing my own thing and doing a YouTube. And eventually I launched a course, my Webflow course, which did take off significantly. And that kind of brought me back into, you know what? I was actually really passionate about this the whole time, but I didn't have you know, what they would call product market fit. I didn't have the right, the right product and the right audience for it and the right marketing for it. And now that I've figured it out, I can focus it on around design education. Also, my other partners were not solely focused on designers. So they wanted to help freelancers or creatives in more general kind of like space. So being on my own enabled me to focus on what I was exciting about, which was designers more specifically. Amazing. It's fantastic. Like that, you know, you experimented and then you did make the whole round just to do what you love, which is education and design and eventually find some kind of a product market fit and succeed in it. I think it's very cool. So by the way, the audience of this podcast is mainly, we have a lot of freelancers, a lot of UX folks, by the way, mostly people that are writers, communicating websites, communicating apps, AO messages, emails, notifications, the copy aspects of things. So I want to chat with you today mostly about, first of all, in your process, like what's your angle of working with writers when it comes to building websites or digital experiences? The second thing is freelancing, but let's start with yeah. that. So initially, like my background, in my background as a designer, obviously I'm coming from the more visual side of things versus the copywriting side of things. But when I worked in a startup, I worked in a startup here in Israel called Anydu, which was a very small team. So we didn't have, we didn't actually have a writer. So it was nobody, it wasn't really somebody, we didn't have an owner for that. So when I was doing designs for the app, it was obvious that I will write, you know, what we call now micro copy and, you know, the, the UX copy for the app itself. And, you know, the CEO would write the marketing. And when I, we worked on the homepage or the website, we would do it together. So, so we didn't have anybody that would do it. So it was my responsibility. And then part of my job to really understand, okay, so how do I do this? How do I communicate clearly? How do I realize that I'm writing the right thing? And then the other thing is because I was writing a blog, I had to kind of, in a way, learn how to write and how to communicate, you know, while I was writing. And then because I was doing projects like Prospero, which was in essence an app that again, I wrote all the copy for the app and I wrote all the copy for the email sequences and, and everything. So I learned how to do that. And then obviously when I started working with clients as a freelance designer, that was part of my service. So, you know, I branded myself kind of like as a full stack designer, meaning I provide them with a full service of everything. Like I would do the design and I would do the copywriting and I would do the, if there was a video necessary, like, or development necessary, like I would get it done. So in essence, that was always to me part of my role. And again, I always thought it was my responsibility to do that. I guess when you're working in a bigger organization, of course, you have more specialization of roles. And so you have somebody whose dedication is to write this specific things. But when the organization is smaller, most people do 
multiple things and writing the UX copy a lot of times would fall, I guess, on the designer versus on the marketing person or something like that. I remember that uh, you did your branding for the full stack designer and that it was on your website. It was really cool. Like I remember a lot of discussions in that era, like 2017, 2016, when people were like, should designers learn to code? And then it was like the unicorn designer that knows to code. And I really loved what happened to the industry since then with like Webflow, that in your channel, you basically take every website out there and rebuild it with Webflow or show the world that it's possible to do it with Webflow. I think that's pretty awesome. Like I really enjoy the, not, not in, even enjoy, I, I really believe in what's happening right now with no code and stuff like that. There's more tools to the ownership of the freelance that way. I think it's pretty cool. So in your in your kind of agenda, you were the type of freelancer that was the full stack. So you were on top of everything. So if there are writers right now that also would like to be, you know, full stack uh, freelancers uh, and full stack product people, for example. So what would be your tip for them? When I work with people, you know, I see that they have problems and I try to help them solve them, right? So some designers would say like, okay, I'm the designer. So, hey, dear client, please send me the copy. Please send me the images and so forth. And then they're frustrated when the client doesn't do it because the client is not a writer himself, right? Or not a photographer himself. So they're frustrated. So my approach is to try to do the heavy lifting for them. So I'm like, okay, I need to figure mm-hmm. out how to write this. I need to figure out how to take photos and so forth. And I'm a very, I'm a person that really likes to learn new skills and try things. So for me, this is kind of like natural, but I guess if you are already doing one service, whether that's writing or something else, and you're working with clients and you see the other problems that they have or in what context they're going to use what you're doing for them, then you can, if you want to, you can try and learn how to solve more problems for them and become in essence, a one-stop shop, right? So if you're writing copy for the app and you're interested in, well, how do they build this app? How do they design it? Like, then you can dive into these other topics and extend your services beyond what you're doing right now. So many people are listening to it right now and they want to do some kind of a transition into something that is new to them, which is UX or design or UX writing. And they say, but wait, how do I find that first client? What would be the tips and tricks as a freelancer to find the first client? There are many approaches to this. The one that worked for me is to, first of all, before jumping out on my own, I used to work on multiple teams. And what that does is besides helping you build your skills and a portfolio, it helps you to create a network of people that you worked with and they saw that it's great to work with you. And then later on, when you want to freelance, you already have a lot of people who are recommending you and sending projects your way. That's, I think, the easy way about this, right? So if you can get a job and do that and then move your way into freelancing. I think that's the easier way to go about it. If you're already freelance, I mean, it's always easier to connect or get projects from people who already know you and trust you, right? So the easiest place to find projects is going to be first your immediately, you know, friends and family. And then after that, your network probably of colleagues that you worked with. And so the broader that is, it's going to be easier for you. Of course, it's always possible to, you know, start building a portfolio yourself and then either cold calling, cold emailing, reaching out to people and that kind of stuff. It's possible, but I think it's harder because when you try to compete with other people who have the benefit, it's all about trust. And if you're reaching out to people with zero context, it's harder to build that trust. So you will need a lot of other factors or ways to build that trust. Yeah. So I, my recommendation but is I feel always, like there is a I feel like there is another tip that we kind of overlooked here, which is, I think you've nailed it and mastered it, but which is being a content creator that kind of attracts clients to him. Yeah. So one way to build trust is to create content, right? Because people can see you, they can see who you are, they can listen to what you say and say, ah, he's actually an expert. And they can, and even if they don't fully understand that, they will look at you know, metrics such as, oh, this guy has a lot of followers. He must be trustworthy and and stuff like that. So those are ways to build, to build trust. But, and I think this is important. This is a very hard way. (laughs) And we were, I was, as I said before, there are a lot of hard different ways 
to do things. And I would always try to optimize for something that is easier because the content game is a long-term play. It takes a while to get good at it. It takes a while to, you know, build a following and so forth. And so it's not the easiest way to get into an industry, right? Especially if you don't have projects yet, what are you going to create content about? Like what experience do you have to share? So it's, I don't think it's the easy way in. It's a long way in. It can definitely work, right? I think uh, as long as you're consistent, it will work. The name of the game here is being consistent, right? Right. But so here's the other thing. You got to love doing it, right? Because if you don't love doing you it, must. you're never going to be consistent. Because again, this is a long term. Like I did a video on YouTube every day for three years before I in a way monetized it or got something back out of it. I think not a lot of people can do something every day for three years if they don't really, really love it. Like I would struggle going to the gym every day for three years, even though I know it's important for my health, but it's very hard for me. And if I don't enjoy it, I'm not going to do it. So, so I do think that it's a great approach to try, test out if you like doing content, but I think if we give the advice to people, oh, you want to, you know, find clients as a freelancer, start doing content every day. And then this can be very overwhelming and it can be also not your sweet spot of how, you, you know, of what you're good at and what you enjoy doing. Some people are very good with people. So they should, you know, just go out and talk to people at events or whatever. Some people are good at different things. So you should experiment to see what you're good at to find that kind of like sweet spot. Yeah. I don't know that it's for everyone creating content. It's definitely not for everyone. But I think in my opinion, in case someone decide to go for it and it's kind of aligned with what he likes to do, I think it's it can be the easiest way to go because I will say though, you know, by you the said, way, if this if is you, a <laughs> I will say, if this is a podcast for writers, if you really like to write and you want to do this every day and get paid and you're excited enough to do it, even if you're not getting paid, so start writing. Like I would think that a good place for writers would probably be Twitter, right? Because it's easy. You're writing. It's even short writing. So if you do that yes. consistently enough, and if you can't do that, if you can't, then then maybe writing is not for you. But if you think writing is for you, then give it a try, right? Even blog posts. Yeah. Blogging. I really like it when people now kind LinkedIn, of I know think trendy. about... LinkedIn is doing great right now. It's crazy. Like yeah. you post there and you get hundreds of thousands of views for a post if you do it well. I don't know. I just tell people, hey, maybe look at some kind of a niche that you like, that you would like to experiment, like fintech and UX writing or something like that, and start researching and see if you have some content to create for this world just by learning just by being curious just like your blog that you did while you were learning in Shankar like a long time ago and yeah some because it's such a micro niche you know UX writing for a fintech you know industry it's really a micro niche so if someone would ever look for that specific person the only per person that is going to land on would be the person that's creating content for that specific niche so Definitely. if you kind of Definitely. find some kind of a niche, I recommend to create content for it. And I do think it's easier than, you know, cold, re cold reach and cold calling. And because then you have their trust already and they're in your, like after seeing your videos, I know 100%, I know who you are. I know I can trust you. I know your processes. You had this fantastic video about like how you outsourced illustration service and combine it and build like a whole brand for this Israeli company that's that is doing exceptionally well right now. And I learned a lot from it and I didn't have any doubt that I could trust you only based on the content that you create. So if I agree with you, it is hard, but if someone thinks that they could be consistent and they like it, I really recommend to go all in into content creation. I think that's a good, it could leverage your career and can put you above all of the noise, in my opinion. So. I know that you have a lot of courses related to Webflow and design and freelancing and so on. So what's the future is like for our industry? What's, your, what's next for us? I think design is going to a very interesting place right now. Specifically, there are a lot of AI writing tools and thinking yeah. about how that is going to impact our work processes, our future as writers or designers. What does that mean? how our roles are going to change. 
you know, I, I find it hard to predict. I don't think that our roles as designers are going to be not necessary anymore, but I think that maybe the tools that we use and the processes are probably going to change and shift. Just like I think a few years ago, people could not predict maybe that no-code tools, maybe Webflow or other no-code tools are going to enable designers to do work instead of developers. And I think that the industry is shifted and the industry is shifting in a way that enables more power to the non-techie person. So that means that designers can be more full stack. They can achieve more tasks when they are solving a design project. That's how, how I think about it top level for the design industry, right? We have a lot of best practices right now. We have a lot of data. Everything is being analyzed. So on the one hand, we have more kind of like templates for how you need to do things and AI doing a lot of heavy lifting for us. On the other hand, we are needed to create the prompt or to monitor that or to think, how can we try something new? Because at the end of the day, these templates and AI can just reproduce what's already happening. So our role is going to be more at the innovation side of things, of kind of like creative thinking is going to be really the skill. And I like that. I'm excited about it. I heard this term the other day, prompt engineer. Yeah, the, for sure. I'm experimenting lately with the mid journey. Are you familiar with it by any chance? Yeah, Dali I haven't tested that. Projects. I've played with Dali. Yeah, I have access to Dali. I didn't get my access. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, it's I'm now, I think it's now journey. open to everybody. I think you can. Oh, really? I'll check it out. I think so. Yeah. Mid journey is, is also a lot of fun. And it's funny because like I'm experimenting with creating a new. Like I read this blog the other day about this guy that changed all of the thumbnail picture in his blog, like 50, to, you know, those AI paintings. And he said how it's going to replace the stock photos and so on. And he talked about prompt engineering and how we experimented with them. So I tried it myself. I tried also to replace like the thumbnail for the blog using those AI tools. And, you know, you really need to play around with the prompt in order to find the results that you are looking for. And yeah. that is going to be some kind of an art that people could By the way, it's learn. already an art. I, you know, when I use stock photography sites, I can spend hours trying to find the right image. So <laughs> in my experience, already in the last 10 years, I've been, you know, trying to hone my stock search sites. And now they already have filtering kind of systems. Yeah, I need three people, two of them are white, like ages, whatever. So I think it was part of our job of knowing how to use the tools, whether the tool is a search stock photography site or music stock or AI. But again, going back to it, the search or the prompt is in essence, the art direction, right? This is like, what are you really looking for? So even if AI is going to be automated in a way with like AI writing tool, somebody is still going to need to define the prompt in essence would be like the brand voice. Like what is the brand voice? Should this be okay? Or should this be woohoo? Like, should this be buy now or please buy or whatever? Like what experience do we want to create? AI cannot make that decision for us. We need to guide it, right? So this is probably going to be the role. I agree. I wonder what will happen in the day where we'll have AI that will create those prompts. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the AI will also use the tool. So we, we can just sleep all day, right? Uh, at the end of the I, day, I we hope we could sleep all day. <laughs> yeah, we build these tools to help us get our job done, but it's on us to define what is the job, right? So yeah, so that's our role, to define the need. Or the problem. That's a really interesting take. And I also think that, we, as you said, I think we'll see it everywhere, like also in UI design. And you could write to the machine, hey, I need this logo, this website. Yeah, so I just saw recently, actually maybe like a year ago, somebody already wrote like a Figma plugin for GPT-3 where you write, design an app in the navigation. There is a home button, like a buy button and something. And it, it just literally designed it in Figma. So it's the world is going there, but somebody will need to, again, define the problem, define what you want and so forth. And that's going to be the role or a new type of role that we don't know yet. Probably like a prompt engineer. 
right? Yeah, for sure. All right. So we're getting into the end of the episode. So we're going to the last question. Usually I ask my guest, hey, Ran, how do you think we should name this episode? And then we kind of brainstorm on ideas and so on. Uh, and then the editor decides if to take it or not. It's not on us anymore. All right. So what do you think? I know. And now I'm just thinking about the last thing that we talked about, which is like the future. Of course, of the, the future of design, design. the future. Yeah. I, I agree. I think it's a, it will be a good name. Cool. But I have a very short so, term memory, so I don't remember what we spoke about more than 15 minutes ago. So we <laughs> talked about your journey and the, you know, yeah, design right. education, all of the yeah, good stuff, I content creation. Future of design. Yeah, future of design is more future promising. Future Big promise. <laughs> cool. Cool. In case people would like to reach out to you and find you, where will be the best place to do so? Well, you're, uh, the best place to reach out maybe is on Instagram, maybe on Instagram or Twitter. Both of them is Ron Segal. R-A-N-S-E-G-A-L-L. -L. So that's double L at the end. And check out Flux on YouTube. That would be kind of like the best places. Sounds good. Everything will be in the show notes as well. So check it out. And Ran, thank you so much for being here today. It was a lot of fun. It's a pleasure, Eva. Always good to Amazing. chat. <laughs> Always good to chat. And thank you everyone for listening to another episode of Writers in Tech that was brought to you by the UX Writing Hub. Check our website. We have a free course for UX writers. My name is Yuval Keshtecher. I am the founder of the UX Writing Hub, and I will see you on the next episode. Bye.